Unfortunately, uh, that is the reason, and also it's also indi- it's a very important indicator of quality in the in the country. So when you say quality in the country, maternal mortality rate, uh, stunting growth, stunting these all come as quality. So the development of any country is dependent on how much stunted you are, how much your maternal mortality, what is the neonatal mortality. It's all dependent on that. That's how our development is actually decided. So if you go to the economic world economic forum, you will get all these definitions about why this. That's the reason that maternal mortality is a very serious issue in the country. It's an extremely serious issue where tomorrow, if you have maternal mortality, not only are you questioned in the court, uh, in in the in a group, you are questioned again and again. That's why, if you see any of the consent forms that comes with with mother, there are many multiple consent forms. You have to be very careful. Every consent form you have to be very careful. But maternal consent forms are very very important, and all what we are writing on the maternal side is very very important. So, embolism uh, in pregnancy is a is another very very important aspect. Very very important aspect in in pregnancy. Embolism embolic disorders in pregnancy. And when we say embolic disorders, there are three specific embolic disorders that we talk about. The first one is pulmonary embolism. The second is venous air embolism, and the third one is amniotic fluid embolism. Now these are the three main obstetric embolic disorders in pregnancy that comes in, which will, uh, which is important for all of us to understand. Very very important for all of us to understand. Now see, I'm going to go very slowly because these are not cases that you regularly see in the ICU. Yeah, very really slowly. So you basically understand what I'm talking about. Okay, hmm? because there are certain things that every ICU will not have. This is something that is very rare also. It's not something that is. Uh, that is there. So we we'll go one by one. The first one is pulmonary embolism in pregnancy. Now, these are the direct causes of death. These blue bars are the direct causes of death. So in the UK, uh, you know there is there is this uh, Embrace UK. This is a big database of maternal mortality. So this is 2016, 2018 in UK. Okay. And what did they find over here was that direct causes of death were cardiac. Uh, but indirect causes of death they found thrombosis and thromboembolism as the second main part. So in the person who dying. Cardiac number one we just discussed peripartum cardiomyopathy and cardiac disorders. <coughs> the other thing that comes in is these hash bars that actually talk about indirect causes of death. Uh, okay, uh, clear on this? Uh, I mean, this is indirect cause of death. This is a direct cause of death. Okay, so direct cause of death. The first Im- most important direct cause of death is actually going to be thromboembolism. Okay, indirect cause of death, for example, heart failure, then causing renal failure, then causing this, then causing that. That is different. But the first and most important cause of death in pregnancy, uh, direct cause, is actually related to embolism, thromboembolism. That's why this discussion, okay, this this is why this discussion is so so important. Even psychiatric disorders, we normally say pregnant female psychiatric disorder. This is very common because of the fact of the tension of pregnancy and things like that. Even that is not as much, is not as much as you see uh, thrombosis and thromboembolism. Okay, so it's a it's a very dangerous situation. Pregnancy is a very dangerous situation, and importantly, some facts. If I were to put it, 5.4 of thousand pregnancies. It's a very big number. When we talk about peripartum cardiomyopathy, is one in ten thousand. This is 5.4 per a thousand pregnancy. Uh, is is what I'm calling this. Five times the risk of general population. Okay, if there are so many uh, 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 sitting over here, a pregnant female has got five times the amount of chances of having pulmonary embolism. <coughs> 0.96 deaths per 100,000 pregnant patients, and the three main causes of death in pregnancy still remain as amniotic fluid embolism, pulmonary embolism, and postpartum hemorrhage. Okay, the three main causes of death in pregnancy they come as amniotic fluid embolism, pulmonary embolism, and postpartum hemorrhage. These are the three main causes of death that we have. So these facts are definitely very hard to take. These facts are very hard to take. It is. Five times the number of pulmonary embolism you get in, in when a person is pregnant. Okay, that's how that's how how dangerous this can be. Pregnancy. Okay, it's one of the very dangerous things. Now this is Rudolf Furkow. He's one of the fantastic persons who basically talked about. Actually, he didn't talk about thrombosis. We when we talk about Furkow, we talk about we talk about thrombosis. We talk about three things that he said. He said that exactly. We call this the Furkow triad. Rudolf Furkow. What did we talk about? We talked about phenomenon due to irritation of the vessel and its surroundings, phenomenon due to blood coagulation, and a phenomenon due to interruption of blood stream. Now, if you look at it, now this is actually pregnancy related. This is not pregnancy. It's not thrombosis. We have taken that and said thrombosis. 
हम लोग ने फर्कआउट राइड लेके हमने उसको थ्रोम्बोसिस के बारे में बात किया है बट फर्कआउट राइड एक्चुअली इज एक्चुअली पार्ट ऑफ पेरिपर्मनरी एम्बोलिजमेंट प्रेगनेंसी Are you understanding? He actually diagnosed embolic disorders in pregnancy by Farquhar. So it's a misnomer if you look at history. Where does Farquhar tract come from? Farquhar tract just came all of a sudden. It was not really Farquhar who talked about it. Farquhar talked about actual pulmonary embolism. Why? If you look at it, irritation of vessels and its surroundings. Okay, this is what is occurring. Hello. Guys, these are all related to the fact that. Uh, pregnancy. The blood coagulation actually changes in pregnancy. There is a hypercoagulable state that develops in pregnancy. Phenomenal to interruption of bloodstream. What happens with the uterus? The uterus actually interrupts one of the iliac arteries, iliac veins. Okay, so this is all related to pregnancy. So if tomorrow, uh, so that's why I don't know from where DVT. We've actually started associating these three phenomena for DVT, but it's not really DVT. What he basically discussed was exactly pulmonary embolism. Okay, this is what Farquhar actually said, and you know Farquhar was one of the very, very big uh, persons who, who was one of the few physicians who had observational skills. His keen observational skills and his physiology, he has done so many things based on his keen <coughs> observation skills only. So at the end of the day, physiology has been turned uh, using his keen observation skills. He came up with these particular, uh, these particular definitions. It was unrelated to the fact. Uh, that he had some laboratory investigation to be done, and at that particular moment also, without a single laboratory investigation, he was actually coming up with pathophysiological definitions. So these are all very great people, you know. They have got the vision to understand things. Okay, uh, we are all, you know, we are being spoon-fed, and still we don't get answers that well as compared to these people. That's why these people are very, very big people. All right. So there are issues with current diagnostics. Now it's very simple to think pulmonary embolism. Now we are back into the situation where we have to diagnose these cases and. And the, the issue with current diagnosis are a lot. Okay, first of all, when you say pulmonary embolism, we have clinical probability scores. We have Bell score, we have Geneva score, we have got all these scores which actually gives you a probability and puts them into two risk statuses, a high risk status and a low risk status. That's how we normally do it, right? If we have a patient and we suspect pulmonary embolism, we put a Bell score and based on the Bell score, we decide whether this is a high risk for pulmonary embolism or a low risk. If it is low risk, I do a D-dimer. If the D-dimer is negative, uh, I see there is no pulmonary embolism. This is what we do, right? In pulmonary embolism, what we do? Once more, I repeat this. We do a Bell score. In the Bell score, we divide them into two parts: P likely or P E unlikely, based on a large number of features, which we around seven or eight features. We say about heart rate, previous history of DVT, uh, um, uh, 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 cancer, and active malignancy, recent surgery. The, all those things come in there. We put all of these together, and then we say, okay, the score is less than four. Uh, if the score is less than 4, let me do a D-dimer. If the D-dimer is negative, then this patient does not have pulmonary embolism and I send the patient home. Right? Or, or I investigate for another cause for his problem. Uh, if I get it as more than 4, then I think maybe I should look at pulmonary embolism. So the problem is here, we cannot use these clinical probability scores at all. Uh, these are patients who are young, no? Where can the clinical probability score will come in? They say, well, first of all, they have been never studied only. They have been never studied in pregnancy. So, what did they? So, they, what did they do? Still, what they do? They still started using that score. They, they still decided, let us use the score because the score is such a beautiful score. The Wells score, Geneva score is such a beautiful score. Let me use that score. Karke, uh, Mark Rigini actually looked at 395 patients in Switzerland. Okay, 11 centers they looked at France, and it's a multi center study. What did they do here? If they had a pregnant woman with a clinically suspected pulmonary embolism, and the pre test, they used a revised Geneva score. You know, the revised Geneva score is this age more than 65 years, pre previous venous from embolism, surgery, active pregnancy. It's very similar to the, to the well score. Unilateral leg pain, hemoptysis, unilateral leg edema, heart rate, heart rate, and they made it to low probability and high probability. You don't need to know the Geneva score, you need to know the well score. Now we're using well score. Okay, but they use the Geneva score, which is also a validated score. They use Geneva score, a validated score, and then they divided them into low intermediate, low risk, and high risk. And just now what we discussed. So in the low risk category, they did a D-dimer. If the D-dimer was negative, they said it was no pulmonary embolism. All right. Huh? If the D-dimer was positive, then they did bilateral uh, uh, compression ultrasounds. And if it was positive, they diagnosed LP. If bilateral leg compression ultrasounds were negative, they did a CT pulmonary <coughs> angio, and then they diagnosed whether this patient has got pulmonary embolism or not. Right, simple. This is what they did. They actually used the criteria we use to figure out pulmonary embolism otherwise to actually figure out whether this patient has got pulmonary embolism or for that matter even try to rule out you might think rule out right i am going to do this if it's negative d-dimer i should rule out pulmonary embolism this is the thinking that comes to your mind right 
doesn't this come to your mind that I can do this like this? In this, what they did find was CT pulmonary angiography was avoided in 11.7% of patients. They avoided that in 11.7% patients and compression ultrasound indicated 1.8% were positive for DVT. This is what they found. Now, what is important for you to understand here is how can you use a score like this whose age is more than 65 years? You can't have pregnant female with age more than 65 years. So, the score per se is illogical. Surgery with a requiring anesthesia fracture of lower with the past month, how many of these have this? How many of these patients, pregnant females, if you will have this kind of a situation? They are the most taken care of of the, of the individuals. They are barely moving about. It's, it's not something that is usually that is usual. Active malignancy? Impossible, right? Pregnancy, young age, active malignancy. So there are three features of this score which logically does not fit into the mind saying that we can use it. They avoided a CT pulmonary angiography in 11.7% patients and 1.8% DVT, right? This is what they looked at. That is the issue with clinical probabilities. These are one of the issues with the current diagnostic modalities that we have. We are understanding. So we, it's not really diagnosed anything. All that they did was they avoided a CT pulmonary angiography. That's all that they did. You understand? They did not really go ahead and diagnose anything. So using the clinical probability scores has a problem. And D-dimer has been rather rather disappointing because what we know is that D-dimer is going to go up in pregnancy. D-dimer is going to go up in pregnancy. So whatever cutoffs that you are discussing that I will do a D-dimer, that cutoffs only doesn't make sense. Okay, cutoffs only doesn't make sense. So are there are there biomarkers that say do this? So so we, we are in the age of, bi of biomarkers. Right? Whatever we do, we want to diagnose renal failure, we do a creatinine. We want to diagnose a heart failure, we're doing a heart uh, myocardial infarction, we're doing a troponin. So we are all in the era of biomarkers where each biomarker is helping us to understand which kind of pathophys pathophysiology is happening or what kind of disease is there. So these DIPAP investigations, uh, investigators, they are from the United Kingdom. Diagnosis of pulmonary embolism in pregnancy is a full form of DIPAP investigators. They do, did an observational study, a cohort study, augmented with additional cases to determine the diagnostic utility of biomarkers for suspected venous thromboembolism during pregnancy. And they looked at uh, 11 uh, centers all across the United Kingdom, 330 or patients were there with suspected pulmonary embolism and they studied a whole lot of biomarkers. Okay, they studied a whole lot of biomarkers. They studied two types. The first type is the clot associated biomarkers. When you say clot associated biomarkers, means whenever there is a clot, these markers will be there. So D dimer, D dimer, plasma antiplasmic complexes, prothrombin fragment 1 plus 2 and thrombin generation. These are the few things that are related to a clot. Okay, in a clot, so tomorrow you want to, if the patient has a part of clot, these are the few things that you will see if there is clot. You know this, huh? And they looked at those other biomarkers, these are not related to a clot, they are related to stress. Okay, so the other biomarkers related to stress, which is normally going to occur in pulmonary embolism, are uh, troponin, beta, nat, uh, beta, beta natriuretic protein, C-reactive MR pro AMP. These are things, I don't know, uh, medulloprotein, these are the things that comes when there is stress of on a ventricle. So they looked at clot related factors and they looked at stress related factors. There are two things that they looked at, clot related factors and stress related factors, all right. Huh? So and they, they looked at all of these things and they looked at false positives and false negatives. You understand? But what did they find? Even if they did a biomarker study, this is the clot. This is the clot side of the story. This is the clot side of the story. Okay, this is... Uh, the uh, uh, the stress part of the story. Okay, this line is right over here. Now, if you want the graph to say that, uh, uh, for comparison, let me explain to you troponin. Okay, if the same graph was determined by troponin, the graph would actually mirror this right angle here, indicating that the diagnostic accuracy is very high. If when any ROC curve you are looking, this is called receiver operator characteristic curve. This is called ROC curves. In the ROC curves. We, uh, any marker should be such that if I do a test, I get a result and how accurate that result is or ruling out or ruling in is determined by the ROC curve, the sensitivity and specificity on this side you have true positive, on this side you have false positive reactions. Okay, so we want less false positives and very good true positives, right, this is true positive, this is false positive, so like uh, we should have it going upwards, so the ROC curve ideally should be right like this. This is how it should be if you want a diagnostic accuracy. Now, and after understanding this, what I'm talking to you, is the diagnostic accuracy good for these biomarkers? Not at all. It's 50%. You know, it's 50%. Can you see it's 50%? Hello? No, not at all. Uh, 
No, Dharanakir is not good. You see, it's it's somewhere around fifty percent. It's like a toss of a coin. So if I were to do a biomarker like D dimer, plasma antiplasma complex, thrombin generation, it's really not a great idea. Similarly, when I do BNP, C-reactive proteins, or any of those markers that we otherwise are using for pulmonary embolism, again it doesn't make any sense, isn't it? Okay, this if this had to make sense, you should have to have the marker somewhere here. These colors are different markers. You understanding? So, can you use any of these biomarkers by this study? It doesn't appear that way. The so the conclusion of this study, this is in 2018, said that biomarkers cannot currently be recommended as a way of selecting women with suspected pulmonary embolism in pregnancy or postpartum for imaging. You understanding? Huh? Clear with this? But in the same time, the years algorithm came in. Okay, this is in the Netherlands. Okay, Netherlands is a another place where they look lots. Uh, on pregnancy, okay. So they looked at something called as a years algorithm. What do they do? This was a multi-center study, an observational study in Netherlands. What do they do? They actually uh, so biomarkers almost out 2018 by by those definitions from DIPEP studies. They actually said the biomarkers are not They decided no, let us still try it out. So what do they do? They looked at all those patients who had suspected a uh, uh, pulmonary embolism and then order a D-dimer test. And then they use three criteria. Which are the three criteria? We know the well score wasn't working well because of the fact age more than 65 and all those things. So they put three criteria: clinical signs of deep vein thrombosis, that means you have an edema of the feet, we have a pain of men's sign, things like that. Clinical signs of deep vein thrombosis, a hemoptysis, okay, and they put up pulmonary embolism as the most likely diagnosis. So they put three very important points. They said if pulmonary embolism is the most likely diagnosis by ruling out everything else, if there is clinical signs of DVT or if there is hemoptysis, then what did I do? I will do a compression ultrasound at the lower limb. Okay, once a compression ultrasound, if normal compression ultrasound, I go to this. Then I will go to years criteria and will add increase the D-dimer cutoff. Initial cutoff was low, less than 500. Now they have increased the D-dimer cutoff. They made it to 1000. Okay, so if it's more than 1000 and there is one of the three criteria, or if one or three of the criteria is there and it's less than 500, but very low, then Palmy and Bonsu ruled out. So they actually changed the cutoff. Made the guy made the criteria to be different, the pretest probability to be different, and they said, Let us now use this probability and let us use this uh, criteria for D dimer and then rule out. They try to do this, okay, and rule in by actually looking at years criteria D dimer more than 1000, perform CT for me, and then rule it this way. So they try to uh, jig the algorithm so that they could get a better answer, okay, and CT for me award is in a higher amount, so 32 to 65 percent initially, it was only 11.7 percent. Huh? In so, so many number of patients, they were able to avoid a CT pulmonary angio and rule out a pulmonary embolism. So it was a great to rule out is what it appears. So now there were IPF investigators said biomarkers don't work. And suddenly the Netherlands years algorithm comes in and says use D dimer. It is helping you to actually rule out CT pulmonary angiography to rule out a pulmonary embolism. And it's a great uh, it's, it's a it's a great rule out. So basically. If you have compression ultrasound, perform CT pulmonary angiography. If that is, this is what they looked at. They looked at only two investigations apart from D-dimer. So DIPAP, they don't work. Artemis, this is the one that we just now see. They are doing something, is what it looked like. Isn't it? They look like something. So what did they do? So what did they do? They did very something very interesting here. What did they do? They looked at the algorithm of the Artemis study just now we discussed. The Artemis study we discussed. And they applied this algorithm to the DIPAP group. You are understanding? Huh? What do they do now? Dipep showed our biomarkers are not working. Artemis said, let me, uh, uh, we have done it in our code, it is working. There is some avoidance of semi pulmonary uh, angiography in this cases, right? Huh. So what do they do? In the patient algorithm, the patients that they had in Artemis, they applied that to Dipep. Or Dipep they applied to Artemis, or the other way around. They applied the Dipep group to the Artemis. Okay. And then there was a correspondence that came right after that, 2018-2019. No? 2018. Suddenly people started going up and Dipep just now said that there's no point of using it. And suddenly the Artemis study comes out in the NEGM and says you can use it. So the NEGM actually uh, did this and what did they find? That it was not robust. When they used the same algorithm to the Dipep group of patients, they found that it was not robust. So it's not a great idea. When they discussed around the table, it was not a great idea. Uh, they spoke to me. Yeah? Spoke to me. This book, this book to me. Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh, tell me. WH. Huh? We can, if the patient gets a DVT, we diagnose it, we start pulmonary, we give pulmonary embolism, we give DVT, we can think of preventing pulmonary embolism. Right? 
unfortunately, uh, amniotic fluid embolism can be neither predicted nor prevented. It can be neither predicted nor prevented. When we are having uh, amniotic fluid embolism, we are checkmated basically. There is no chance that we can diagnose it. Uh, I mean, you can prevent it or uh, predict it. You cannot do both of them. So it's an extremely dangerous diagnosis. And if you thought the incidence was low, it's not. Six per 100,000 deliveries huh, have had amniotic fluid embolism. Six per 100,000 deliveries. Okay. Core level median patient age was around 29 years. I mean, 29 years was approximate time when they had pulmonary embolism. This database comes from a very large database. The UK actually has got a huge database. They can just look at all those patients and then put them all together and give you some incidences. Okay. So look at the number of patients. 14 A6, 4 lakhs, uh, 6 lakhs, 84,135 deliveries they looked at. In a national inpatient sample base, and they looked at all the hospital discharge criteria for this. For this, and what did they find? That there are three reasons, three associations. There are not reasons; there are associations. So one was patient related, other was pregnancy related, and the third was delivery related. And they found that older age, Asian black race, Western US region, pre-gestational hypertension, asthma, illicit substance use, and grand multivariety was the patient-related features for amniotic fluid embolism. Pregnancy means placenta abruption, uterine rupture, polyadrenalinous, fetal demise, all these things came into a preeclampsia, all the complications. And the third one was generated, early gestational cervical happening, almost everything. If you look at it, almost everything. Almost everything that you have with pregnancy, almost everything that you have with pregnancy can cause an amniotic fluid embolism. I put this up to understand that everything, even a caesarean delivery, even a caesarean delivery or a forceps delivery have got an incidence of amniotic fluid embolism. So almost everything in pregnancy state uh, has got an incidence of having amniotic fluid embolism. Alright, so how does this occur? Now this is the fetus, huh? this is the uterine placenta, this is the uterus and that is the heart. So what is happening here is, when even a patient is deeply breathing, when the patient is deeply breathing, there is going to be an increase when it is return. We, we discussed that last time. When we increase when it is return, so there is a high possibility that uh, uh, when the uterus is contracting at the same time, uterine contractions that might cause this uh, 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 you know embolism to go up. So once during just by deep breathing, you can have a movement of the placental product up. Second, by just having uterine contractions, you can have this going, uh, having amniotic fluid embolisms. Okay, you, you got the point. Huh? So both these things, just deep breathing and just uh, uterine contractions can actually lead to amniotic fluid embolism is what it appears. And what goes, what goes in, in that amniotic fluid embolism, we, when we talk pulmonary embolism, we talk about clot. But what goes in amniotic fluid embolism is a whole lot of rubbish that comes from the amniotic fluid. What is that? Metanol plasma transudate, fetal urine, fetal intestinal mucus, meconium, fetal skin flakes, danugo hair, fatty acids, cholesterols, prostaglandins, zinc copropophyllin and electronic acid metabolites. The whole lot of things that is there in the amniotic fluid is going into uh, the systemic circulation and causing problems. And what does this cause? Of course, these, these things may cause immunological effects. So if they cause immunological effects, release of mediators, they may mechanically obstruct the heart. They may mechanically obstruct the heart. Not only it causes an immunological feature, they may also mechanically obstruct the heart. The third thing it can do is it can activate the complement system releasing an intense inflammatory storm. An intense inflammatory storm. And it can cause a coagulation system activation leading to hypercoagulable states. And DIC. You understand? Huh? And DIC. So this all will culminate, this all will culminate as a clinical feature, which includes left ventricular failure, which includes neurological problems like coma, seizures, and near residual deficits, and acute respiratory distress syndrome, and other organ dysfunctions like acute kidney injury. Are you understanding? So these, it's not just one entity. It's not like pulmonary embolism. It's like everything together. Okay, so we have amniotic fluid embolism, where a multi-system organ failure can come and settle. You can have acute kidney injury, you can have ARDS, you can have anything, anything under the sun, when it comes to acute. Uh, so, at the end result, the terminal result of all this thing would be hypoxia, shock, and DIC. The terminal result will be this hypoxia, shock, and DIC. This is the problem. Okay, so how do you diagnose this? So, at the end of the day, you want to diagnose it. Now, tomorrow, if there is, okay, if this patient has had it, you want to diagnose the problem. So, the Society of uh, for Fetal Maternal Medicine actually come up with a diagnosis uh, saying that, a definition saying that sudden cardiac arrest or both respiratory and hemodynamic collapse, biological disseminated intravascular coagulation, which is including you know, all the products, you know, you see fibrinogen going up, profibrin going down, and D number going up, and all those things, biological disseminated intravascular coagulation, and absence of fever, and clinical onset during labor or within 30 minutes of delivery, 
indicates amniotic fluid involved. Right? Uh, and what are the pre monitoring signs? So, this is the pre monitoring signs. Okay, the pre monitoring signs, because it is, you know, as you saw, the neurological mechanisms are very different. The pre signs at that time would be neurological signs, abnormal fetal heart rate, respiratory signs, atypical signs, arterial blood hypertension, skin rash, thoracic or abdominal pain, and sudden hypertension or cardio cardiopulmonary arrest, hemorrhage, and sudden DIC. Uh, clinical onset will occur within 30 minutes. This has been proven again and again that this is what you might see in patients. You can see anything this means. You know, you can see absolutely anything that upsets vitals. Is what it appears, right? Huh? Now this graph is very important. 70% occur during labor. Huh? 70% occur during labor. 11% after a vaginal delivery and 19% during a cesarean section. Okay. Now. Uh, look at this. What is contributing to the hypoxia? When we talk about we talk about hypoxia, right? What is contributing? So when you look at this, this is the early phase. This is the late phase. Okay. In early phase, because that will how your treatment will be matter when the hypoxia is coming in. You know that's how it's going to be. So initially, because this this as you understood by amniotic, amniotic fluid embolism, it could be either capillary leak, it could be fluid overload, it could be immunological mechanism, it could be anything. So, because each of these will have different. If there is a cardiac uh, failure, you need to give diuretics. If it is going to be VQ mismatch, you need to intubate, prone ventilation, things like that will come in. You need to understand what is coming when, right? So, what is known, what is known is that in the early phase, in the early phase, it is actually a VQ mismatch. Means it's an inflammatory disorder. Okay, it's a VQ mismatch. Okay, ventilation perfusion mismatch. That means shunt physiology is going on. It is not failure. Okay, and then later on, uh, th th it becomes distributive shock. Later on, it becomes distributive shock, which is like DIC, which is like sepsis. So it starts with shunt physiology RDS, okay, starts shunt physiology, and then goes into distributive shock. So later on, distributive shock predominates, cardiogenic is second, and obstructive is last. Earlier, you start with now, you, 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 uh, in, uh, in the, the early phase, you are, this is see, this is the VQ mismatch that is the highest in the early phase. You, you understand? And this is how it basically changes. All right. Now, how do you diagnose them? Okay. The first thing, first thing would be distal pulmonary angiocatheter, or uh, distal swan cans catheter, and aspiration. When you aspirate, you get debris, fetal debris. When you aspirate, it's impossible to diagnose like this. It's kind of impossible. You know, you cannot, when a patient is having breathlessness, is completely down, put on the ventilator, you can't put a swan gans and, and aspirate. But that is one of the diagnoses. This is the gold standard. The gold standard is if you have a swan gans in place and you aspirate from there and you get fetal maternal debris, fetal debris, like Lanugo hair, you get amniotic fluid. That goes in favor of amniotic fluid embolism. But we 99%, 100%, I have not, uh, it's not something that you can do. You cannot put in the swan gans at that particular moment. The second thing is fetal antigen serology. Again, something that is not available. Fetal antigen serology. Again, something that is not available. There are certain markers, biomarkers that is released after fetus has, uh, uh, fetal antigen has got exposed to the maternal side. Okay. So that, that also is not something that is freely available. The third thing is if the patient starts coughing out maternal, uh, fetal debris, patient starts coughing actually happens. If, Patient starts coughing out greenish color fluid, yellowish color fluid. That is the third thing. Very, very dangerous. I mean, seeing that only, thinking about that only is kind of dangerous. Okay. The fourth thing is doing bloods. Of course, it is not sensitive. Like doing CBC, doing CRP, doing BNP, doing all these things. It's not something that is going to be sensitive at all because it could hold a whole lot of other things can cause all those immunological markers to change, all those CBCs to change, all those CBCs to change. And the four, fifth one is an imaging feature of ARDS. Okay, imaging feature of ARDS. So in short, none of these can be used to actually uh, diagnose amniotic fluid embolism because none of them are practically oriented. None of them. Okay, that is why clinical feature definition is very, very important. Clear on this? Huh? That's why the definition is very, very important. How do you manage them? So you do everything that you do in the ICU on a regular basis. That is what you do. You, you maintain this normopsia. You try to maintain the cardiac output with whatever technique you can not at night and mechanical pump, whatever, whatever you can maintain the cardiac output because this is the problem. The third thing is decontaminate. Very rarely, there are some features, because it's so rare disease, this is such a rare disease, uh, that's why there are not many studies that have done it. So people have used CRRT to decontaminate. They've used charcoal immobilization to remove because at the end of the day, what is the problem? The problem is the fetal amniotic fluid. So try to remove the fetal amniotic fluid by whatever extracorporeal therapy you can. They are trying to do all these things. And the fourth thing is pulmonary artery vasodilatation because there is hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. Let me open up, open it up, okay, by using nitric oxide, prostate, and things like that. Okay, 
None of them has been proven. These are all just small studies that have actually showed two or three papers that have shown this particular thing, like this. Uh, what have they done? They are trying to decontaminate. Okay, what have they done here? Continuous hemodial filtration, CRRT, but DIC, coagulation, shock duty, amniotic fluid response, they found a response. It's just papers. It's not like there are 15, uh, 100 patients and 150 No, it's not like that. Uh, as to the population, 82% here again they did CRRT. Here, uh, removal during cell salvage in cesarean section, they did cell, sal cell salvage and they tried to remove it out. So, extra corporal therapies to remove amniotic fluid because what we understand is amniotic fluid is causing the problems. So let us take it out. Again, nothing. This is just case reports. Okay, that's why I said at the end of the day, do what you do in the ICU regularly, properly. That is what you're supposed to do. Okay, that's about pulmonary embolism and the uh, and amniotic fluid embolism. Okay, any idea about venous air embolism? Any of you all in pregnancy? Huh? How does venous air embolism come in pregnancy? If I would ask you a question. So no, so this will be slightly uncomfortable if for people who don't like to hear sex and stuff, but this is what it is. Okay, I'll explain about the various anabolism, orogenital sex during pregnancy. This is how it is. So it's come once in the papers also. Orogenital sex during pregnancy followed by dyspnea, abdominal pain and loss of consciousness. This is this happens during pregnancy. This is how venous embolism, air embolism comes in pregnancy. And there are studies that have actually looked at it. But there are studies of only single patients. Because it's not it's more rarer than otherwise. It's more rarer. So what is happening over here? If you look at it, this this is, is, is a 29 weaker, but 29 weaker, the partner inseparated a large amount of air into a vagina, partner possibly do hair into a vagina, abdominal pain, nausea, loss of consciousness, she underwent hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and both mother and infant survived. So we can't look at any of these. Go look, go look, go look, huh? We cannot look at any of these uh, and say that do hyperbaric oxygen. We can look at the others, all of them have died otherwise. Uh, all, of, all of them have died. You saw that, no? All of them died. You saw that? Yes. Huh? All of them have died. You just can't survive after that. Almost all of them died. Okay, I think two, only two papers show survival. One is this one. And then we don't know how they survived. Huh? And there is one more die, one more over here. Mother survived on hyperbaric therapy. Baby died in the, in the third postpartum day. Okay, this is something that is there. Apart from this embolism, there are many other. For, that was pregnancy associated, specifically associated with pregnancy. Okay, venous air embolism, amniotic fluid embolism, and pulmonary embolism specifically associated with pregnancy. Apart from that, the regular embolism that occurred to everyone else can also occur in pregnancy, which includes particulate material embolism, which includes septic embolism, which includes gas embolism, hydrated cyst embolism, tumor embolism, fat embolism. This is can occur to anyone. But what we discussed was the embolic disorders that occur in pregnancy. Okay, that cannot, that is what we discussed specifically. And these are, you know, this is, the, this lady, I don't know whether you all know this lady. This lady, um, she was, her, everyone was looking at her pregnancy uh, for, for, for quite some time. This is recent, I think uh, 2021 or 20 or something. This lady's pregnancy, she's a, she's a, she's a YouTube influencer. You have these influencers, Instagram influencers, sorry, Instagram influencers. You have these influencers who just talk about something and they get money, they get crores and crores of money, influencers. So she's actually an influencer. So the whole world was actually following her up. Because as her pregnancy was increasing, she was posting pictures, she was saying, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm doing. What Everyone was following her because she's an influencer, very big influencer having you have crores and crores of followers on her. Okay. And she actually died of a pulmonary embolism. She actually died. Pregnant influenza cause of, uh, cause of death at 26 was explained as pulmonary embolism. So it occurs to anyone basically. It can occur suddenly, pulmonary embolism. Right? This also, uh, and, and if you if you don't diagnose it, you can be medically very in a problem. Look at this. A woman died shortly after giving birth to her daughter did not receive the correct medication and coronavirus rule. That's why don't, not do not think of not giving LMWH. We should give that LMWH. Okay? Because even the coroner court, I will actually put a case on them for not having given LMWH up to the pregnancy. They stopped it some time back. She was a known case. They stopped it 2-3 days in advance. She developed pulmonary embolism. Coroner said no, you should have actually given till, till, till delivery. Which we discussed. Which we discussed. It can be, it can be uh, disastrous to do that. That's how, that's how serious it is if you don't stop the, if you, if you stop the LMWH. And importantly Serena Williams, isn't it? Serena Williams had pulmonary embolism. She almost died after giving birth to her daughter. Serena Williams. Recently this happened, right? Four years ago, Serena Williams, she delivered and she talked, talked to the world uh, and this statement became very important. 
I almost died after giving birth to my daughter. It's, it's, it's said in many uh, statements about how Sir Williams battled this. And importantly, long ago, you know, in history, Princess Charlotte is a very famous princess. Okay, Princess Charlotte. Okay, she died, and they thought it was postpartum hemorrhage. But then they analyzed, reanalyzed, analyzed, reanalyzed, and now, in uh, later on, now in 2018, in 2018, that is after so many years of her first paper coming out, nine, uh, in 18, 19th century, 19th, 18th century, she died. They came out and said it was likely due to pulmonary embolism <coughs> than due to PPH. You understand? So it's not that it is. It has been there. It is now. It is there from the past. From your mother has been there from the past. Okay. Any questions here? Any questions? Sir, one second. One second. Ah. Uh, in the abnormal fluid embolism, fluid will remain in the body. Uh, the irritant situation still remains yes. in the body. So, how even like when even if you support your treatment, what will be the curative treatment? No, nothing curative. It's just supportive. There is nothing curative. So, if the patient, uh, so we've done all sort of things in in, in at least the abnormal fluid embolism that I have seen. I've done a lot of few things. Like for example, when there's ARDS or what are the ARDS victim? Make you steroids. You know ARDS. It's ARDS making you steroids because it's an immunological cause. If it's classical ARDS, I saw uh, you know steroids, prone ventilation. I've we've done a few cases. If there is heart that is not working because of mechanical obstruction, like a like a uh, like a embolism, uh, a, a, a kind of a physical embolism, uh, mechanically circulated device, we, we we try to use maintain the heart for some time and then hope that that particular thing moves off. But you know, just classically these patients are very sudden. They are so sudden that the patient uh, is very difficult to salvage. It's very difficult to salvage unless you are attached to a very good hospital that has got all the facilities to do this. Huh? So we have had, I have had, I have seen two amniotic fluid embolisms till now. It's rare. It's not something that is uh, because we, by the time they reach, they are almost they are gone. So uh, I have seen two which we have salvaged, which we have salvaged, and patient has done well also. Amniotic fluid embolism. They presented with snowstorm appearance. The entire lungs being completely wiped out within some time. So that is clear indication that this is amniotic fluid embolism. Uh, it was clearly amniotic fluid embolism that had occurred because of the sudden inflammatory uh, alveolar capillary, capillary leakage, which actually caused the lungs to be completely wiped out. We put them on the ventilator. The patient was on the ventilator. See, classically they are young people. Classically they are young people. They are not elderly individuals with diabetes and hypertension that has this. Classically they are young people, so their reserves are very high. So you cannot leave. It's like uh, it's like the other patient that we have a retrospirosis over there. You can't leave him. You can't leave him. He is he is very young. How much ever he may be, he is in diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. We will not leave him because he has a high chance of coming out. If that same diffuse alveolar hemorrhage was for an 80 year old gentleman or a 75 year old gentleman, we would probably think twice before doing many other things. Now you might be wondering why is Dr. Sanjay doing so much on that 27, uh, 28 year old? He is pura gaya hai, pura bleeding or such a No, no, I will not give up. Similarly, in pregnancy, in pregnancy, you should not give up because they are pre pregnancy by God has created a resilient state. A state that will probably help these females to incur more amount of uh, stress than any other person. So you will do whatever it takes to get this patient out. You will not call it quits. You understand? So our last amniotic fluid embolism patient was on the ventilator for 17 days. Okay, 17 days. She did well. She came out. She is not no, completely normal. Completely normal. Our postpartum cardiomyopathy patient underwent a transplant. We had a postpartum cardiomyopathy patient over here. She was uh, uh, she was on this bed. And she had come with postpartum cardiomyopathy. She her EFA dropped to 15 percent, 10 percent, not even 15. It was 10 percent. So we worked with her on the ventilator for a long period of time. She came out of all those things. We put an IVP for her also. Uh, baby survived. She also survived. And she underwent a transplant uh, four years ago. A heart transplant. She's now normal. So young people, the classically young people. Okay, that's the reason that we should do whatever it takes to get them out of this condition. So there is no treatment per se. It's purely supportive. It's not like it's not like pulmonary embolism where there is treatment. You understand? That's why uh, amniotic fluid embolism is a very dangerous, very very dangerous thing. Okay? Hmm? Sir, what is IVC filter? What is IV? What is IVC filter? Okay, we can uh, wait, 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 wait. So what is IVC filter? So IVC filter is what? It is like an umbrella. It is like an umbrella. Chhatri. Hmm? It's like an umbrella. What happens is it's, it's got a mesh and it sits in the inferior vena cava and whatever clot comes from down it holds that clot. 
it doesn't allow it to go to the heart because one of the problems that we are going to have is that clot embolizing from here obstructing the heart and causing problems isn't it this is the problem with DVT so an IVC filter is put for that however there are very few indications that are almost next to not there because IVC filter is put for only those people who develop, who develop a clot despite being on optimal anticoagulant therapy ok despite being on optimal anticoagulant therapy you are understanding because IVC filter also will require anticoagulation because it is a filter after all it has to be placed over there it will, otherwise it will create a clot because it is a foreign object that itself requires anticoagulation right so it is a very few indications for uh, for IVC filter like for example you had a patient on DVT large DVT is there fresh DVT is there ok you have put him on 0.8 mg per kilogram of LMWH this he was on LMWH and then 15-20 days later developed another pulmonary embolism which you diagnosed on CT pulmonary angio you did a CT pulmonary angio and you are going to diagnose kind of now you diagnose CT pulmonary angio Diagnosed. Now, patient was an LMWH, still developed CT, uh, CT scan findings of pulmonary embolism, despite being LMWH. Now, CT pulmonary embolism is a life-threatening condition. It's a life-threatening condition. She can die because of the, he or she can die because of the pulmonary embolism. So, in that case, despite of anticoagulation therapy, there is a chance of death. So, in that case, I will put an IVC filter. It cannot be placed for life. IVC filter after 3 months has to be removed also. You understand? It cannot be placed for life. It has to be removed because it will be removed. So that has to be taken out. So that IVC filter is taken out. Once you, so there are many situations where you cannot give optimal anticoagulant therapy. So at that time you will probably think about giving IVCs. But the role of IVC filter is very very low. Very very low. It's barely there. Uh, I, I, I think the last IVC filter we put was some ages ago. Some one or two years ago. Right? Any, any other questions? So yay. It does have to do with cesarean or then the so no, a, pregnancy I, related, no, pregnancy related venous air embolism, mm -hmm. it can be only hydrogenic. Okay, in the sense, if you look at pregnancy associated, that venous air embolism can occur in anyone. Mm -hmm. What you are talking about okay. can occur in anyone. That hydrogenic, what you are talking about, that you do it and then it goes inside. Mm -hmm. What we are talking is when you are pregnant. Okay. Are you understanding? Mm -hmm. huh? Like fat embolism can occur to pregnant female. It's, it's general population. But Tomorrow, a person who is having orogenital sex and is not pregnant will not get venous air embolism. Are you understanding? You have to be pregnant to have venous air embolism after orogenital sex. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You, you understand? Huh? You got the point? You, you understand? That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. So venous air embolism, uh, fat embolism, all the other mechanisms are, can occur for anyone sitting here for any other cause. But we are talking about pregnancy specific. In pregnancy specific, these are the ones. Specifically for pregnancy. So if somebody asks you about disorders of pregnancy, these three have to be talked. You can't talk about others. You can't talk about uh, fat embolism and things like that because that's not something that is associated with specifically pregnancy. These are specifically associated with pregnancy. We have primary embolism specifically associated with pregnancy because of the hypercoagulable state you have. Amniotic fluid embolism because you cannot be pregnant. You cannot be normal. You, you have to be. You have to have amniotic fluid to be pregnant. Okay, and the third thing is venous air embolism, which occurs only with the uterine flexes being nice and big, placenta being nice and big, that's why you're getting it. Clear? Hmm? Okay. Let's. Uh